Welcome to Smart Catalyst, December 7, 2018. So today we are going to see all these prelims article. The first one is Cabinet clears the policy to double the agri exports. The second one is current account deficit may fall to 2.2 percentage. The third one is Sino-India joint exercise hand in hand. The fourth article is Cabinet's disinvestment proposal. And the fifth article is National Mission on interdisciplinary cyber physical system and the sixth one is places in reason news and the last prelims article is report on air pollution so the first article is current account deficit may fall to 2.2 percentage so what the news here is the analysts and the researchers have recently revised the CAD to 2.2 percentage because previously they estimated like it will be nearly 2.8 percentage for this financial year 2018-19 but due to the oil prices falling over the last two months and the rupee strengthening against the dollar they revised the CAD to be from 2.8 percentage to 2.2 percentage okay so if you see the trend of this CAD it is like 0.6 percentage in 2016 and it increased to 1.9 percentage in 2017 and Again, it increased to 2.4 percentage simply in the first quarter of uh, this year, mainly because of the historical high of $85 per barrel. Because before it was like nearly $72 per barrel, but again, it got jumped to a very high value. But during the last recent two months, it reduced to simply $58.6 per barrel. So because of this low only, they now revised it to 2.2 percentage. Okay, so now we are going to see what this current account deficit means. So before going into this, we have to know what this balance of payment means. So this represent the amount of money which a country should give to another country or a country can get from another country, which means it might be negative or positive. Okay, so if you see in this context then balance of payment consists of two major component one is the capital account another one is the current account so it capital means it always represent a huge amount of money which uh, deals with investment or infrastructure related activities or the funds or aids which it received from other countries etc but current account means it relate to the day to day activities or a smaller amount of money when compared to the capital account okay so here you have to know one thing that our, in our country the capital account is positive that is it is surplus but the current account is negative it is deficit that is why the cad is negative which it which it is nearly 2.2 which was recently estimated okay so now we are going to see what this current account means so the current account of any country consists of three components one is the trade component or trade account which is dealing with the trade activities carried out between a country and another countries and the second component is net income factor and the third major component is transfer payments okay so if you see this net income it deals with the wages dividends profits whatever the the entities which prevailing in an economy it is receiving so all these things all these smaller things which it received by means of investing in capital those things coming under this net income component and transfer payment net transfer payment means it contains remittances which it received from the NRIs OZIs etc okay so it is income to the country right so in net income and transfer payment we are positive we are receiving but in this trade account we are having deficit that means we are exporting lesser than what we are importing our import is more right so because of that our trade account is deficit because of that our current account is deficit so that is what this current account deficit means okay so as per our country our current account is in deficit and capital account is in positive that is surplus so the next article is cabinet clears the policy to double the agri exports so what the news here is we all knew that our government is actually aiming to double the farmers income by 2022 right 
so not only for that but also for increasing our export to 60 billion dollar by 2020 also the union cabinet recently approved this agriculture export policy okay so how they are going to achieve it means by means of diversifying the exports basket and destination and boosting the high value and value added exports which focuses mainly on the perishable items and also by means of promoting the novel indigenous organic as well as the traditional and non-traditional products so these are all how they actually aiming to achieve this okay so to all this they provide an institutional mechanism for efficient market access and affordable market access to all farmers as well as to all the business entities small especially the smaller business entities and they can easily tackle the barriers and it also deals with the sanitary and phytosanitary issues okay so these are all covering under this agriculture export policy so not only in terms of agriculture and imports and exports but also the government has framed some policies in terms of technology as well as in power sectors okay so these are those two things one is integration of the rural electrification corporation into the power finance corporation and the second one is national mission on interdisciplinary cyber physical system so these two things are also introduced by the government so what they are we are going to see it in the next slide so this is what which deals with the power sector the cabinet's disinvestment proposal that is the cabinet committee on economic affairs economic affairs recently approved for the strategic sale of government's 52.63 percent equity shareholding in rec to the power finance corporation so it not only this but also the management is also getting transferred to the power finance corporation so why they are doing this means so this kind of strategic merging of rural electrification corporation with the power finance corporation will actually increase the efficiency of its process and increase the operational functioning okay so these two that means the rec and the pfc both are navratna company which means it can invest up to 1000 crores and both are public companies okay so this is the policy on technology so recently the union cabinet approved for the launching of national mission on interdisciplinary cyber physical system so and it is being implemented by department of science and technology so what is the objective for this national mission means it would address the technology application and human resource development by means of establishing 15 technology innovation hub six application innovation hub and four technology translation research box okay so they are going to mainly focus on technology development hrd skill development innovation entrepreneurship as well as the startup ecosystem development and the international collaboration among all the countries the next article is sino india joint exercise which is hand in hand so this exercise hand in hand between china and india is an annual event or annual exercise and main aim of this hand in hand is to promote close relationship between india and china as well as we can uphold the values of peace prosperity and stability in the indo-pacific region as well as the south china sea region and not only for that but also for developing mutual understanding and respect for each other's military especially in terms of army and also it deals with the tactical level operations of counter insurgency counter terrorist environment mainly to eradicate the terrorism so this exercise is hand in hand so the next article is places in recent news so we all knew that very recently qatar actually withdrew from this opec right so in that context we have to know about this opec and one major important country in that OPEC which is this Venezuela so if you see here the Venezuela actually recently have faced a lot of crisis especially the migration crisis because of its so why migration means especially because of the misgovernance as well as the destabilization of its economy so why Venezuela is suffering means if you see in terms of Venezuela nearly 95% of its income to Venezuela is mainly dependent on its exports. So it is a major exporting country and 95% is by means of this export of oil resources. Okay. So only 5% is by means of importing. So whenever there is a fluctuation in the crude oil or oil uh, resources or oil economy, then 
the country which is mainly dependent on this oil reserves is going to affect a lot right it, it is only going to get affected a lot so venezuela is also similar to that only so it is major economy is dependent on the exports of oil it is facing severe crisis that is why lot of people are migrating from venezuela to other countries because its in inflation is very much higher it is hyper inflation okay so because of that only this migration is happening but if you see one interesting point over here the venezuela is a country which is having highest number of oil reserves so it is having highest number of oil reserve and if you go deep into venezuela if you see here in this picture so now we are going to see some important places in venezuela so this is river orinoco it is the largest river in south america after amazon river amazon river is the largest river in south america and after amazon this is the second largest river which is orinoco okay and one more fact here is it is lake maracaibo it is the south america's largest lake okay south america's largest lake so one more thing is the andes mountain which is the largest mountain in south america that is also passes through this venezuela okay so the next place is tajikistan so recently india and tajikistan actually signed a memorandum of understanding on outer space treaty okay so in that context we have to know certain things about this tajikistan so if you see here the tajikistan is present in this central asian region here so this is tajikistan and if you go deep into that the alay mountain it is present in the northern side of the tajikistan and this pamir mountain is present in the southern east direction of tajikistan and this fetchenko glacier so this is the largest non polar glacier okay so not polar it is non polar glacier in the world it is the largest and one more thing here is the amu darya river which is flowing here in the south to tajikistan and the siri darya river which is north to T tajikistan it both merges at oral sea okay so if you see in this map here it is oral sea right so it flows and joins there so the next article is report on air pollution so india state level disease burden initiative report so this report is jointly given by icmr phfi and ministry of health and family welfare so in this report there are certain facts about the air pollution and its impact so if you see here the india has 18% of the world pollution and nearly 26% of the global premature deaths and disease burden is happening only in india and mainly due to air pollution so out of 100% dying prematurely nearly 26% are only from india so that much severe it is and it is mainly due to air pollution and one out of eight deaths in india is only attributable to air pollution alone so in india one person who are dying out of 8% they are having diseases related to this air pollution and nearly 12.4 lakh deaths in india is due to air pollution and in the 12 six is due to outdoor pollution and four is due to household air pollution and one more shocking fact here is half of the death due to air pollution were especially affected the people who are less than 70 years of age so for prelims perspective you have to note one thing here it is nacs which is the national ambient air quality standard okay so this is a simply a standard and they are taking like 11 polluters into account while calculating this standard so they are the nitrogen dioxide sulfur dioxide carbon monoxide okay and apart from that particulate matter 2.5 and particulate matter 10 and ozone apart from that lead ammonia benzene arsenic and nickel okay so these are all the items they are taken while calculating this standard and they fixed some standard okay but what the concern here is nearly 77% of our country's population are exposed to more than that limit which is prescribed by this nacs okay so if you see here in this side the particulate matter 2.5 which is very worst in delhi delhi has higher amount of particulate matter 2.5 and the bmr states which is the bihar 
Madhya Pradesh, Rajasthan, Uttar Pradesh, the state which is already socially and economically backward, it is having worst air quality. That is what the report found. Okay. So one thing you have to note here is the air pollution which is recently experienced by our country as a whole it actually causes many diseases which are common in smoking if you are smoking then whatever the disease you are affected by that is the same diseases are also affecting the people who are exposed to this air pollution like stroke chronic obstructive pulmonary diseases and lung cancer so it is a major concern right so if you see here the disability adjusted life years so it means if a person is disabled because of any reason then the productive lifespan or life year of that person is getting decreased right so it is actually adjusted that means according to the disability of a person the productive life year is getting decreased that is what this disability adjusted life year so in this context the air pollution is also causing certain kind of diseases and disability to the people so that DALI, that is that disability adjusted is more than or as high as the diseases which is attributable to the tobacco usage or the smoking. So this is what they mention here. That means if an average life expectancy of a person in India is certain 60 years say, then because of this air pollution, now it is getting reduced to 1.7 years. That means so now it is nearly 58.3 years only. So we have to take in care all those things. And we have to take measures in order to reduce this air pollution at a very speeder level. So now we are going to see the main article. The first one is shielding the witnesses on protection scheme. The second one is still on the last chance saloon. The third one is building a framework for RBI surplus transfer. And the fourth one is lessons from the World Bank on ease of doing business. Okay. So the first main article is shielding witnesses on protection scheme. So the condition of the witnesses in the Indian legal system is very pathetic because we are taking the witnesses for granted. So in order to tackle them and in order to give more protection to them, the Supreme Court on Wednesday approved the first witness protection scheme. Okay. So if you see the background, the this witness protection scheme was pending in the legislation state itself in the parliament for a very longer period of time and the need to protect the witnesses has been emphasized by both the law commission report as well as the court's judgment for years so they are stressing on the need for such protection scheme but still it is pending in the parliament so the supreme court has asked the state government now to implement the scheme which is framed by the center okay so what is the main objective of this scheme means it is uh, actually ensuring the protection of the witnesses in the criminal trials and the criminal cases from threat, intimidation and undue influence. So why we need such kind of witness protection scheme means because our judicial process, our country's uh, legal process or judicial process is very tardy, it is very very slow and also the conviction rate is very less and the acquittal rate is very more. Why? Because the witnesses are threatened actually. So because of that only there are a lot of acquittals and very lesser conviction. And there is little incentive for the witnesses also to turn up to the court, to come to the court and testify against the criminals. Which means the Supreme Court or the High Court, they never take the time they lost. That means the time the witnesses lost or the distance they have travelled in attending the cases. They never take all these things into account. They simply just told them to return to another day. So these are all very, very lesser incentives, right? And also the threat to the lives of the witnesses is a major question. So they are very much uh, harassed and uh, experience hostility while attending these cases and coming to the courts. So for all these only, in order to tackle all these and to give them more protection only, this witness protection scheme is now coming into force, okay? So one major uh, positive he thing here is, if you see, the center actually deserves the credit because they just want to introduce this witness protection scheme as a judicial mandate instead of waiting for formal legislation, which means you don't need to go uh, from step by step. That means in parliament like Lok Sabha, Rajya Sabha and then finally into president's assent. So these are all things are now actually discarded and just by means of judicial mandate, this witness protection scheme comes into force. Okay, so this is a major and positive move, right? But one major change over here is before in 2006, the law commission actually recommended the center and the state to share the cost for uh, implementation of such witness protection scheme. 
so now it changed to like the full budget or the full uh, fund should be given by the state government and the donations okay so under this witness protection scheme they want to ensure the protection to the witnesses right but how means by means of in camera trial proximate physical protection to those witnesses by means of giving more police protection and anonymizing this is very important thing anonymizing their identity so these are all could help the witnesses to be safe but the real test or real uh, concern over here is the advanced forms of identity protection because giving the witness a new identity new address and even parentage with matching documents so all these new identity or anonymizing the identity it needs to be done without undermining their profession property rights and educational qualification etc right but if you see similar kind of anonymizing the identity of the witnesses have been followed in previous uh, years also so by if you see in case of anti terrorism the case is dealing with the anti terrorism or child centric laws so in those cases and all we actually followed the similar kind of anonymizing or uh, hiding the identity of the witnesses so instead of this ad hoc step we have to make it as a clear mandate so that is uh, one major thing and now as of now a few dedicated court rooms for vulnerable witnesses mostly for child victims or functional so this should be expanded but however expanding such facilities and implementing a comprehensive and credible witness protection program will pose logical and financial challenges but it is worth that much because it will be worth as the scheme could strengthen the india's tottering criminal justice system as a whole so the next article is still on the last chance saloon so we all knew that our the climate is changing and the global temperature is rising and in order to tackle that this cop 24 meeting of unfccc it is going on now so in that context now we are going to see what are the discussions that is going on in that meeting and what are the decisions that have taken okay so if you see the implementation of activities of the paris agreement 2015 it legally begins in 2020 and should end in 2030 it is different from sdg it is like 2015 to 2030 right so this paris agreement climate change program it is 2020 to 2030 okay so as per this paris agreement all the countries which is in the united nation they agree to take some steps in order to reduce the climate change or the global warming as well as the global temperature and they actually fixed that level to 1 to 1.5 to 2 degrees celsius so 1.5 to 2 degrees celsius of the pre industrial level okay so but what the major concern over here is already the average global temperature have crossed 1 degree celsius above the pre industrial level so we are having very little to reach that much uh, temperature right so and also the concentration of carbon dioxide in the global atmosphere is 410 ppm which has never been seen by the human era as a whole ever okay so to take some forward steps in order to tackle this climate change only this cop 24 meeting is happening and in that they actually stressed on the fact of far reaching speedy transformative changes in the society is needed thereby we can maintain the temperature at least 1.5 to 2 degree celsius and it should be achieved through technological changes as well as the lifestyle or behavioral changes of both the developed and the developing countries and apart from that there should be a focus on mitigation and adaptation process that means you should take some pre steps or precautionary step to reduce the climate change as well as already our globe is warming so we are in a warmer world so for that we have to adopt right so some adaptation steps should also be taken so this is what they stressed in this cop 24 meeting so this cop 24 mainly aims to set the guidelines for the countries and they come to a final rule book which is an extension of the paris agreement guidelines and also to implement the pledges whatever taken during the paris agreement which is made by various countries in 2015 okay so one thing you have to note over here is indc which is intended nationally determined contribution so these are the targets which a country needs to achieve in order to tackle the climate change so every country is preparing this indc on its own 
ahead of Paris summit and during the Paris summit it just go and summit it just went and summit this INDC and if it is accepted by the Paris agreement then it is replaced as NDC which is the nationally determined contribution so we are also having one NDC and it is promising as well as it is more good and effective than the other developed countries such as US and China so all the countries which are having this nationally determined goal NDC right so if you try to implement all those NDCs for implementing all the NDCs put forward by the countries it actually need 4.4 trillion dollar according to 2016 German watch report but in reality as per the green climate fund the developed countries are actually planning to give 100 billion dollar per year to the developing country and also the world bank it is also planning to give some 200 billion dollar to the developing country for achieving this ndc goals but it is very lesser than what it is actually estimated we need 4.4 trillion but it is very less so that is what put forward here so this oxfam report is also stating like the total net finance amount which is transferred from the developed nation as well as other institution to the developing nation is stand only like 16 to 21 billion dollar it is very very less right and also in that calculation there is some double counting and counting of development aid leveled against developed countries so there is there is some error in the calculation of fund that is what they are actually telling here okay and also the article 9 of this paris agreement it calls for the financial support of the developed countries to the developing country and the author is actually raising a concern by stating like if this situation continues then the world may go into the phase of sixth extinction that is the massive destruction of the species on earth as a whole okay so this is a major concern so the next article is lessons from the world bank on ease of doing business okay so we all knew that the ease of doing business report is released by the world bank recently and in that our country have scored like 77th rank out of 190 country from the 100th rank last year so it is a major improvement and the world bank actually uses some 10 parameters while calculating this ease of doing business so in this article they are stating like how the calculation has done and what are some misouts in those uh, report and what could have been done thereby the these kind of calculations could be more efficient so all these things are covered in this article okay so if you see here our country have improved in construction permits trading across the borders and starting a business but we are very lagging in registering property paying taxes resolving insolvency and all so in that report itself they are stating like there is more scope for the improvement in access to the jobs and the livelihood okay so under the national trade facilitation action plan india actually have implemented several initiative which actually improves the efficiency of cross-border trade reducing border and documentary compliance time for both exports and import so in all these things we actually get improved but India has also done some significant reform in getting electricity, paying taxes and on credit access. Okay, So this ranks that means each year's rank actually reflects the reforms undertaken by the countries every year. So in that we are actually improving means we have taken some good reforms. So in this world EDB, New York, so in this EDB, ease of doing business, New Zealand is stands first and it is consecutively third time it stood first okay and second one is Singapore third one is Denmark and if you see in our context India actually invested lot in port equipment strengthened management and improved e electronic document flow that means we are actually digitizing everything that is what they are telling by means of including more IT infrastructure and we actually enhanced the risk based management now thereby we allow the exporters to seal their containers electronically at their own facilities itself so it is a major move for the exporters okay but though this edb represent all the context it cover all the context it actually missed out certain scope uh, certain areas like the ease of doing business doesn't take these parameters into account like macroeconomic stability informal sector development of the financial system quality of the labor force in a country the bribery and the corruption in a country the actual market size of each and every country and lack of security 
all these things are not taken into account by the EDB. So that is what the major concern. So we have to include all these things. That is what they're mentioning. Okay. And they are also telling like there is one major important 11th dimension which is about the labor market regulation. So the World Bank should include this as 11th dimension in the upcoming years. So this is mentioned in that article. So actually we have done this GST demonetization and all and GST in that GST is a major reform. But this major reform is not taken into account while calculating the ease of doing business for India. That is one major concern over here. So it is actually less representative than what it is. And also one more thing, they are taking only Mumbai and Delhi, those cities into account while calculating the EDB, not all the uh, cities or states. So it is not that much inclusive. So that is also mentioned as a flaw here. And the lowest score for India is for registering the property followed by enforcing the contracts as we have seen before, right? And the fundamental issue of accurate and high frequency data on employment is a major, major question because there is no data at all on employment in our economy or in our country. If there is no data on employment, then there is no way to uh, target those people, right? So if there is only data is available, then only we can target them and give them more livelihood and more employment generation and all. So lacking of data is a major issue or fundamental issue and it is a very great handicap to our country. So we have to take uh, some steps thereby we can generate more data regarding this employment facilities which is available in our country as of now. And the report doesn't provide a template for the combination of and also the same EDB report doesn't provide any kind of template for combination of employer flexibility and the employee protection also. So all these things should be included in the upcoming ease of doing business report. That is what the author state here. Okay. So the last article is building a framework for RBI surplus transfers. We all knew that recently there is a tussle which is going on between the RBI and the government. And the government is actually eyeing on the RBI's excess reserve, thereby it can meet its fiscal deficit. So in that context, now we are going to see uh, this article. So here they are telling like, RBI governor has reiterated before a parliamentary panel that RBI reserves is only for a period of stress and not for meeting the normal needs. So if you see here for that purpose only a committee was actually established to go into the issue of this economic capital framework of RBI or the reserves of the RBI must hold in its in the interim. So for example consider if RBI is having in its reserves a surplus of say 8 rupees and if the ECF that is the economic capital framework is fixed at some 3 percentage or 3 rupees or 4 rupees then the remaining 5 rupees is a surplus to the RBI right. So it should be transferred to the government in order to handle or tackle the financial conditions or financial distress of the government. So this is what this committee actually meant for. And in this context, actually, if you see the Japan is having like 5% as its ECF and Greece is 8%, Turkey is 12% and US is having a separate to transfer the net earnings to the US Treasury. So it is now actually being followed by India. Okay. So these are some examples of global laws, but we have to take all these things as an example, right? So we all knew that RBI is actually aiming at the stability of the prices in our economy. So this objective of price stability has been met by our country independent of the surplus whichever the RBI had in before like 2008, before economic crisis and all despite of how much reserves or how much surplus the RBI has, the objective of price stability has been met. But aftermath of the global financial crisis, the central bank, including the RBI, most of the central bank started transferring its surplus to the government. Okay. So before they were not giving, but after the uh, global economic crisis, they started transferring the surplus to the government by means of this economic capital provision. So recently a new committee was appointed, right? It is also required to design a framework for this economic capital rather than fixed or rigid formula for the surplus transfer which, which was prevailing before. So as per this context, whatever the surplus which the RBI is generating, it should be transferred to the government after making provisions for two funds. That is before the surplus reaches government, 
that should the RBI should transfer the money to two of its major account one is the contingency fund and another one is the asset development fund so after transferring the surplus to these two fund then the remaining surplus should be transferred to the government so this is what the mandate which is happening now so what this uh, contingency fund and asset development fund means so this contingency fund is a fund which is mainly used in three scenarios one is depreciation in the value of securities then this money can be released and second one is exchange guarantees for exchange guarantees also this money can be released this contingency fund and third one is risks arising out of monetary or exchange rate policy operation if the rbi is setting repo rate or reverse repo rate and if any risk arises out of that then only this contingency or emergency fund can be utilized and similarly this adf fund of rbi when it can be utilized means it can be utilized in two situation one is to meet the interim capital expenditure that means temporary capital expenditure and the second thing is making investments in the subsidiaries which means subsidiaries of rbi means it is banks or other institutions investment in subsidiaries and associate institutions so these two funds are under rbi and apart from this only the remaining surplus should be transferred to the government to tackle its target okay to meet its target so as of now this contingency fund and asset development fund is at a range of 7 percentage but the actual target of rbi is 12 percentage so the central bank is actually wanted to achieve this 12 percentage from the 7 percentage okay so what the major concern over here is simply because of the poor cash management of the government it should not affect or it should not have any kind of implication over the liquidity as well as the debt management of the rbi so it is a cyclical effect right and thereby it impacts the asset and liability of the rbi balance sheet thereby it consequently affect the profit and loss account of the rbi which in turn affects the surplus of the rbi so the basic thing which is the cash management of the government should be first corrected so that is what they mention here and this kind of process of some immediate or temporary transfer of the surplus to the government is against the principle of the transparency and integrity so how this surplus uh, is actually generated how the amount is fixed and how that cap is fixed and how the remaining money is transferred to the government all these uh, things should be more transparent and should be uh, credible so that is what they mention here so they concluded like the issue of surplus transfer takes into sweep not just accounts but also the gamut entire gamut of issues related to the transparent monetary as well as the fiscal interface